again, maybe it was some year last June, so I can't really remember, that we are still in Bible prophecy, which is clue to Daniel chapter 12, but the Lord laid this subject upon my heart to teach, I believe it was Sunday night that I told you, on the subject of the blood moons. How many has heard of it? Several or just a few? Uh, actually, the blood moon teaching uh, is really catching on fast in the realm of prophetic teaching. There are major prophetic teachers that are teaching this and listening to their teachings and seeing that we are in the middle of a T-tread, and I will explain that to you later, and that it is happening right now. And given what some of these prophetic teachers are teaching, I wanted to teach on the subject to explain to you, if you have not heard of it, then you will, after tonight, have an understanding of what, if you're turning to a religious channel and you turn to a prophetic teacher who's teaching on the blood moons, uh, then you'll have an understanding of what he's talking about. And it is events that they claim will show signs uh, of the end times. And you know that I am strongly an advocate and a proponent of the teaching of the end times. So I want to say, first of all, about this teaching, and I have titled this Bible study, The Blood Moon's Teaching, Prophetic or Theory. And I titled it that because that I am not persuaded that it is what they are teaching it. It is a possibility. First of all, I want to say that I am not convinced that the occurrences of these blood moons are prophetic. I'm just not at this point. Having said that, it is a possibility. It is, perhaps. I'm just not convinced of it as of yet. It is becoming an accepted prophetic teaching by some major prophecy teachers today. And that's why I'm teaching on it tonight, to give you understanding that when you hear the term, I've been asked about it uh, by others, by people outside the church, my views on the subject, do I think what they are teaching is correct, uh, and then I hope to give you that answer by tonight. Uh, but first, before I get into explaining exactly what the tea treads are, and the blood moons are, I want to go into Scripture first and go to the Scriptures that they are using to support this doctrine of the blood moons. And if you have your Bibles, want to follow with us or on the monitor, why you can do so. And one of the first Scriptures that these prophetic teachers use, and they're renowned prophetic teachers now, uh, one is John Hagee, one is, uh, I believe, Mark Blitz, or Mike Blitz, I have the note. Another is Irvin Baxter, uh, another is Terry Stone. I've been listening to all of these gentlemen in their prophetic teaching. A lot of what they say I agree with, and a lot of what they say I completely disagree with. But I wanted to go into Scripture first because they do use Scripture to support this teachings of the blood moons. Now, by the way, Wednesday a week ago, there was a blood moon. Uh, it happened, I think, in our area around 4 a.m. in the morning. And I'll explain to you exactly what a blood moon is in just a bit. But the first place in Scripture we want to go to is Genesis chapter 1 and verse 14, and they emphasize this scripture. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament. You know, the firmament is the expanse that you see in outer space and beyond. 
of the heaven to divide the day and the night. And this is where they make a point. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And they place emphasis upon the part of that scripture that says, let them be for signs. And I do agree that there will be signs in the heavens. I do. Especially in this last time. Not only in the heavens, but in the seas. The seas roaring, the Bible says. I believe that these activity, uh, I believe as Jody said, Sunday night, happening more frequently, the earthquakes that cause a tsunami which is nothing more than an underwater earthquake that is causing death and destruction. I do believe in signs from heaven and in the sea. I believe that. Um, I just don't, I'm just not ready to accept these gentlemen's teachings on the blood moons as of yet. Not saying that I will, but I'm certainly saying as to date I have not. But this is one scripture that they use, Genesis 1 and 14, and they use that particular phrase, let there be signs. And they're talking about the heavens. Uh, I always took that to mean because it followed up with for seasons and for days and years. When we have four seasons, you know that. Uh, we have night and day, we have that. And... Uh, it could be applied to both the signs of the seasons um, and also signs of the end times. The second place they go to in Scripture is Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 32. And listen to what Joel said. Now, Joel is absolutely prophesying of the end times, the end of the world. He absolutely is. And he says this, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. You old men shall dream dreams, and you young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out of my spirit. And I will shew, now listen to what he said, And I will shew, or show, wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness. Now this is the key phrase. And the moon into blood. Before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. Leave it right there before you go on to verse 32. Now it is a sign. And Joel is prophesying before the return of the Lord that the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood. I'll say this right at the outset, and I doubt if there's any that will see it any differently. He didn't mean that the moon will actually and literally and physically and metaphorically be changed into blood, the liquid. Okay, that's not what he meant by it. But he did say that this would happen before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes meaning in the end of time, verse 32. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Now, I'll make a brief point here. I think that he's specifically talking about the Jews in the midst of great tribulation. I have been asked down through the years, what will be the plan for salvation for Jews? In the great tribulation period, would they have to be baptized? Would they have to have the Holy Ghost? No. Only those that is in the times of the Gentiles has to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ in water and be filled with the Holy Ghost and live holy and dedicated life. 
during the time of the great tribulation period, the Bible says, and all Israel shall be saved. This is how they're going to be saved. This is their plan, in my view. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. That word delivered and salvation is interchangeable when you read the study of the Hebrew and Greek. For in Mount Zion, in Jerusalem, shall deliverance, or be deliverance, and the Lord has said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. So all the Jews that will have to do to be saved in the time of great tribulation is receive the Lord Jesus Christ as Messiah, God himself in flesh, and call upon the name of the Lord, and God will save them. There are denominations today that are trying to apply that scripture to salvation in the times of the Gentiles. It does not work. You can call on the name of the Lord all you want to on your deathbed or any other time, and it will not save you. They need to learn to rightly divide the word of truth. But the point being made in Joel's prophecy of the end time, that Joel said, before the great and terrible day of the Lord come, that the moon shall be turned into blood. Acts chapter 2. Verses 17 through 21. Now, what we're about to read here is Simon Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost, both concerning the end of time and the baptism of the Holy Ghost. He practically quotes Joel verbatim here. In the midst of his preaching, in Acts 2, 17 through 21, he's speaking to the Jewish nation of Israel of the baptism of the Holy Ghost that many of us in this building have tonight. And listen to how he phrases it. And it shall come to pass in the last days. So we know that, that Simon Peter is referring to Joel's prophecy, whose was in the end time, as the last days. There is a difference between the phrase last days and end time. Last days began 2,000 years ago. We are in the end time now. Joel prophesied not only of the signs in the heavens before the great and terrible day of the Lord come, but also to the nation of Israel that God was going to give them of His Spirit, the Holy Ghost, that will dwell within them. Simon Peter's preaching about it. Probably five to six hundred years after the prophecy of Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last day, says God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Now watch this. He, he's saying virtually, identically, what Joel is saying. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood. And these Proponents of this teaching of the four consecutive blood moons say this is proof that something is going to happen during the time of one of these periods. That's what it's called. And they seem to have some historical proof of it that I'll give to you in a few minutes. But Simon Peter is quoting Joel, the sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. He's preaching that tribulation message. But in the meantime, he's preaching of the baptism of the Holy Ghost that would come to the church 
on that day that he's doing that preaching. Because the Bible says if you would back up to Acts, and you don't have to, I'll just tell them what's there. From Acts chapter 2, verse 1 through 4, it's speaking about the Jews assembling together on a Jewish festival called Pentecost, the day that God had chose to give the Holy Ghost to His church, that He would come on that day. And it says, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they was in one mind and one accord and being in one place. And suddenly they heard a sound from heaven as of a riding, rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them clothing tongues like as of fire. And it sat upon each of them. And they all was filled with the Holy Ghost. Acts 2 and verse 4. That's what his preaching was to the church. That it's time now for Joel's prophecy to begin to come to pass, and it would begin in the last days, 2,000 years ago, and they received about 120. The Bible don't give a specific number of 120. The Bible says about 120. Made it to the upper room, and they all were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak in other tongues. That was the beginning, per se, of then, now almost 2,000 years has passed, and we're coming down to the end now of where we're approaching the time that the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord comes. See? So we are that close. If this Bible's, how many believe the Bible's right? I believe the Bible is the inherent, infallible words of Almighty God given to us in letter form, written on these pages, that we might know the times and the seasons and the generation of the coming of the Lord, that we can warn the world in this end time that time's running out for people. And so many people's playing around on God. They're playing church. They're half in church and they're half out of church. It's time to get all the way in church. Right? I don't mean to sound harsh, but I'm just going to tell you how it is. You need to get in or you need to get out. And I base that up on the message that was sent to the church at Laodicea by Jesus Christ himself when he said, I would, or in other words, I rather... You would be hot or cold. Because if you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. Being hot is being on fire for God. Being cold is being out there. But there are people, always have been and always will be, that are trying to straddle a fence that there's not a fence to straddle. You're either in or out. You're right or wrong. You're saved or lost. You can't be half saved. You can't be half lost. You're either all the way lost or you're all the way saved. Say amen. That's the gospel truth. People need to hear this kind of teaching. People need to hear this kind of preaching. It's time to stop playing church. Church is not a playhouse. It's not a courthouse. It's a house of prayer. That's what the Bible calls it. Say right? Now, there's nothing wrong with a young single girl or a young single boy meeting each other in church. There's not a better place for them to meet. Right? That's great. But what I'm saying is just to come to church to get a sugar bunny, you're coming for the wrong reason. Right? You're coming looking for a wife, you come for the wrong reason. Well, husband, we come to church to worship God. Right? This is the house of prayer, a place of praise, a place of worship. Right? Well, since I've said that, I'll say this. If you're single and you're looking for one, make sure they're in church. Make sure they're apostolic. Baptized in Jesus' name. Filled with the Holy Ghost. Living right and holy. Right? Make sure of that. 
and you can get yourself into trouble. A lot of people do and have. Right. But back to the study. Joel prophesied of the end and the beginning of the end of God sending the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Peter confirmed his word. The Bible says, by the mouth of two or three witnesses, shall every word be established. Is that not true? Are you enjoying this? I am. Is not God good? Amen. We need to know the truth of God's Word in every aspect of His Word. We live by it, and we die by it. The next place they go is Luke chapter 21, according to Jesus. Verse 22 through 28. Now again, as Joel and as Simon Peter in Acts, we know by verse 22, the period of time that he's speaking of. Jesus said, for these be the days of vengeance. That's when God is going to take vengeance upon this world. You see, I believe right now, even though that the love of God is throughout, and his mercy endureth, and he's plenteous in mercies and in truth, at the same time, he's very, very angry at this world. He's looking down at this sin-filled, sickening world. And destruction is on his mind. And it's going to happen. And he's going to rain fire down from heaven. And he's going to unleash demon spirits and powers out of hell that are torment people. And as we studied in our Bible studies, after the writing of the four horsemen of the apostolate, there shall be 1.7.5 billion people killed. God is angry. The Bible says our God is a consuming fire. Don't play with Him. Don't play with Him because if you play with Him, you get burned. Don't we kill our children? Matches, back when I was a boy, seemed to fascinate kids. I guess it's the striking and the lie. Kids, you get a hold of them, first thing they do is slap you. Next thing you know, they're setting something on fire. Most likely, they'll get burnt. That's the same way God is. Our God is a consuming fire. We don't take Him lightly. We don't take Him for granted. We take Him for what He says. He says what He means, and He means what He says. He built, and I'll put it in Brother Wolford's layman's term, he built a big fire right in the center of the earth. It's called hell. If you don't get your heart right with God, that's exactly where you're going. Right? I mean, that's a fact. That's a biblical fact. But the love of God did this. He left heaven to come to earth to manifest himself in flesh that no one would have to go by. Ain't that marvelous? Ain't that something to be thankful for? That nobody has to go to hell. He has already made the way. His blood is still fresh. He's still saving. And I still say, and I feel it in my own spirit and have for the last past few years, that God is trying to deal with the lost and the backsliders more so now, seems like to me, than any other time. Trying, what God is trying to do is get them in. And he uses preachers like me that will speak straight and stern from the platform to warn you. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Say, well, it don't matter how you live. It does matter how you live. It don't matter how you dress. Yes, it does. It don't matter how you wear your hair. Oh, yes, it does. It don't matter how you are baptized. Yes, it does. You see, that's what the denominal world is teaching and preaching. They are lying to people right from the platform, telling people that it doesn't matter. That all you have to do is call upon the name of the Lord and you'll be saved. And some of them is going all far enough to say, not only you, but he'll save your house too. That's not true. That's not true. 
Jesus didn't come to Calvary and shed his blood and suffer all that he suffered that we could live any way we want to live and still be saved. Well, if that be true, God did not say that. That's not really up to God. But Jesus said, for these be the days of vengeance. That's when God is angry. I believe he's angry now. That all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe unto them that are with child, them that give suck in those days. Jesus is speaking of the same period of time that Joel did, which is the seven years of great tribulation right here. But woe unto them, speaking of the Jews, that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. For these, or for thus shall be great distress, or these shall be the days of great distress in the land, and wrath upon the people. Wrath is his anger. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations, speaking of Israel. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Remember verse 24. Remember that phrase. The Jew, Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles because that is one of the signs that these people that Jesus is the sea tread, or the blood moon uses there in verse 24 of Luke chapter 21, verse 25. And listen to what he says again. Now these people have Bible for what they're saying. The question is, are they in context? And that means everything. Are they in context with what they're teaching? I'm not convinced that they are. And there shall be signs in the sun. There he goes again, same as Joel and Peter. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon, he said. And in the stars and upon the earth. The stress of nations with perplexity. The sea and the waves roaring. Men's hearts failing them for fear for looking after those things which are coming upon the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man, speaking of the same period of time that Joel and Simon Peter alluded to. And then shall they see the Son, the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads. For your redemption draweth nigh. And that is a message to us, the church. Telling us that when we see these things begin to come to pass. The signs of the coming of the Lord have been for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. That these signs have been coming to pass. Even in our generations before our very eyes. Jerusalem being trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. One of the signs, again, coincidentally or not, happened and occurred during one of the sea trips. Israel becoming a nation in 1948. Sign in our time. I think it was the blossoming of the fig tree of Matthew 24 and 32. They associated with one of the sea trips or in close proximity of one of the sea trips. They have a point, but is it a strong enough point to make a doctrine out of it then? I'm just not convinced of that. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up, lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. So we have Moses writing that there would be signs, or the stars would be for signs, Joel prophesying that the moon be turned into blood. Simon Peter quoting him, which is a fact, that we will have to agree that something is going to happen concerning the moon. And the Bible says that it be turned into blood. Are we to take that literally? I say no. No more than we are to take literally Revelation 19.11, when John said, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him. 
I don't believe that Jesus is coming back on a literal white horse as depicted in Revelation 19.11. That is symbolic. When you study the book of Revelation, and not only the book of Revelation, but also the book of Daniel uh, that we just completed, it is a book of symbolism. He used in Gentile terms and phrases, in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, he used metals as in reference to nations that would rise and fall. Speaking to Daniel, the Hebrew boy, when he showed him of the same things, he used animals, leopards, lions, and bears. And they were symbolic of nations. And we must understand that when we read and study Bible prophecy. And a lot of things are not to be taken literal. And again, I don't believe that the moon would be turned into literal blood. And back to Luke. Or rather, the last place we go in Scripture is Revelation 6 and 12. Now we've had Moses writing other signs. We've had Joel writing other signs, the moon particularly in the blood, so is Luke writing Acts, quoting Simon Peter, Jesus himself speaking. So so we must, even by that, I have to agree in as much that something will happen concerning the moon. Revelation 6 and 12. Again, we know by the opening of the phrase that it's in the midst of the great tribulation. It is the opening of the sixth seal. Now listen to what he says. Now I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black. Remember one of the other writers wrote of the sun becoming black. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, And notice how John phrases it. And the moon became, he didn't say blood, but as blood. So when you put the phrase as blood and into blood, then we can only conclude that it is a metaphor. And that he's not talking about the moon be turning into literal blood. Because that's not what John said in Revelation. That whatever happens during this time, the moon will become as blood. And again, they associate these putrids. Uh, what is the color of blood? Red. And I'll agree with that. Uh, so that is the, the basic scriptures that they use to support what I'm about to read to you concerning a couple or three of these prophetic features that features these blood moon teachings and how they teach them. One gentleman made a major, major blunder concerning them. And the question is, what is a blood moon? I do believe that I misspoke, and I'll tell you on Sunday night and explain what a, a mistake was. I think I have it backwards. But anyway, I confess I was a little bit. What is a blood moon? A blood moon is when the earth becomes between the sun and the moon. I believe I stated Sunday night it's, it's the moon that comes between the earth and the sun. That was incorrect. That's not what creation an eclipse. A total lunar eclipse is when this happens. A blood moon is when the earth comes between the sun and the moon, creating a total lunar eclipse, causing the sun to shine through the earth's atmosphere, casting upon the moon a red shadow. And it is a proven fact that that is exactly what happens when there is a putrid or a blood moon. When the total eclipse happened last Wednesday, which was October the 8th, when the alignment and the earth came between the sun and the moon, the sun rays shine through the atmosphere of the earth, and according to 
Albert Einstein, light will bend. And as it passed through being a total eclipse and bending, then it passed and made the moon look red. And that is a fact. That's what happens in a total lunar eclipse. The moon gives the appearance of red, or there's a red shadow cast upon the moon. According to NASA, when four successive total eclipses occur in a row, four in a row, with six full moons, it is referred to as a Petrad. That's what we call it, Petrad. P-E-T-R-A-D, if you pronounce it properly. When those four blood moons occur, and along with six full moons, it's, it's a rare occurrence that happens in the heavens, according to NASA. Now I'm going to read you some of Irvin Baxter's thoughts concerning the blood moon teaching. And, and Baxter is a post-tribulation teacher whom I disagree with fervently on greatest parts of his teachings, but he has some information concerning these, and I've told you, I believe Sunday night, that these would be other men's teachings. I'll just simply educate you on what blood moons were and what his teachings are. And this, according to Irvin Baxter, he's a renowned Actually, if I'm not mistaken, he's a UPC apostolic, uh, but he's a post-tribulation teacher whom I fervently disagree with on that part. But according to Urban Baxter, a post-tribulation prophet teacher, and his research from 1 AD to 2013, there have been 55 petrids, which is not a lot over a space of 2,000 years. It's not a lot. There have been 55 tetrids, which is not very common. However, when a tetrid falls on a Jewish feast day, they are very rare. Very rare. When a tetrid, which is four total lunar eclipses, all four lunar eclipses on four different dates fall on four Jewish holidays. One could almost say extremely rare. In the past 2,000 years, there have only been 10 of the 55 that has occurred on Jewish feast days which makes these tetrids, according to their teachings, rare and significant. Well, no one can deny that, that it is a rarity, that 10 of the 55 in 2,000 years have failed on four Jewish feast days. And that is their connection. Their connection they're connecting the blood moons as happening on Jewish feast days. Now listen to this, according to his research. Seven of these petreds happened before the year 1492. How many knows what happened in 1492? Columbus discovered America. You have an intelligent group of people. 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. That's what they say, Right? They told us that in school. And I have no reason to doubt that. He sailed off from Spain in three ships. But anyway, this is what Baxter says concerning that event. So I'll read you later. Anyway, seven of the ten petrids that happened on Jewish feast days happened before 1492, the year Columbus discovered America. And only three afterward in a span of 500 years, there's only been three petrids 
in the past 500 years. We are now in the middle of the fourth. Okay? And you'll get the significance of that in a minute. The teaching is that the last three, beginning in 1493 into 1494. The next one was 1949 into 1950. The next one was 1967 into 1968. That a major event is happening. Now, what they are saying, and this is historical fact, that on the last three hatreds, that something significant has happened in the history of the nation of Israel. Now, we know that Israel is the primary focus of Bible prophecy. The primary focus, not Gentiles, not anything else, but Jerusalem and the land of Israel and the Jewish people is the primary focus of prophecy. They are connecting all of this together in which I don't disagree with that part. They say on these last three, beginning with 1493 into 1494, Something significant has happened. And I'll tell you how they connect Columbus with it. Because you didn't read it in history books. Um, and I'm not saying it's true. And that since these events has happened, they expect something to happen in the Middle East concerning Israel from 2014 into 2015. We have already had two blood moons in the year 2014. The final two in this tread will happen next year, one in April, I believe it is, and one in September. They are teaching that when this concludes, that in this time, something major will happen in the Middle East based upon the last three teachings. Now, what happened? In the 1493-94 teachings, now we know that Columbus discovered America in 1492, right? Baxter says that's close enough in proximity to these dates to include it. But his study of other historians, he adds a little more to it that I just read, but I wouldn't even say that I believe it. But in 1493, a year after Columbus discovered America, the blood moon, there was a, and this is true, there was a Spanish Inquisition. Have you ever heard of the Spanish Inquisition? The Spanish Inquisition occurred in which the king and queen of Spain began to force the Jews to convert to Catholicism. In that day, when Catholicism was a state religion, they didn't ask you to join. They forced you to join. It was join or die. Basically the same thing that ISIS is doing in the Middle East right now, going into these villages in Iraq and Syria, and if they don't convert over to the Islamic State, the, the, the belief and interpretation of the Koran as those people in ISIS see it, then they're either to convert, leave, or die. Believe it or not, the Catholic movement was an evil, evil, evil empire and slaughtered thousands. They slaughtered Muslims because they wouldn't convert to Catholicism. Here during this time, during the Spanish Inquisition, they were forcing people to become Catholic. And according to these teachings, convert or be killed, the greatest majority of Jews fled and many were killed. 
According to their teachings, this was the purpose of Columbus discovering America. Now, this is the part that I'm not sure about or particularly agree with. They say, according to their teachings, this was the purpose of Columbus discovering America, creating a safe haven for the Jews. That is not a good story. According to Baxter, and some, according to him and his research, some historians believe that Columbus was actually Jewish. I don't think there's anything that, that, that says that either. And set sail to escape the Inquisition. They even say that, now according to our history books, the king, queen, Spain, her name might have been Isabella or something of that nature, Finance that trip for Columbus when he set sail and he discovered the new world. According to some histor- historians, according to Baxter, they were some Jewish rich men sponsored that trip that he may discover wealth and come back and rise up and fight against them. But there's no, to my knowledge, other than these particular historians that Baxter references says that, but that it being an actual historical fact, to my knowledge, it is not. As far as I know, Columbus set sail, and his backing was by the king and queen of Spain. Now, it is true there was a Spanish Inquisition going on at the time, and a persecution of the Jews. So they say that he tread there, is in direct association with Israel. Sign number one, that is the sign in the heavens. At that period, they was four. Perhaps two in 1949, or two in 1493, and two in 1494, a total of four. And the significance of it with Israel, all four of them fell on a Jewish holiday, Passover and the Feast of Tabernacles. In the 1949-50 blood moon, they associated with Israel becoming a nation. Now, we know Israel became a nation in May 14, 1948. That there kind of presents a little problem with their theory to me. Being, God being sovereign and allowing Israel to become a, a nation in 1948, he could have as well allowed it to have occurred in 1949 in the year of the blood moon as opposed to being the year prior to the blood moon. How many of you are getting where I'm going? See, God's sovereign. God don't miss and he don't make mistakes. He said, John, it was three days and three nights in the belly of the well. He was out of three days and three nights. He told Noah, to build an ark exactly so high, so wide, and so deep, he had to build it exact. It seems to appear that they are a year off here with their date 1948 and the blood moon beginning in 1949. But Baxter says that it's in close enough proximity to the date to associate that major event happening in Israel who claimed that that was a sign given by the four blood moons. In the 1967 and 68 blood moons, Israel takes control of Jerusalem according to the prophecy of Jesus that we talked about not long ago, that we just read in Luke chapter 21, that when that Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now, this blood moon happened, or the first one, in 1967. Well, the Six-Day War happened in 1967, if I'm not mistaken, from June 5th through June 10th, which was a total of six days, and they took back control of Jerusalem. They say and associate the taking back up control of Jerusalem with the four blood moons of 1967 into 1968. 
that it was significant and God ordained, and it's a sign. Now, the next key thread, which is already started on April 15th of this year, was one. And if I'm not mistaken, on April 15th was Jewish Passover. Was the first one. The second one occurred on October 8th, and you could pull that one. That was the Feast of Tabernacles in 2014. The third is to occur on April 4th, 2015. Well, that will be Passover again. And the fourth on September the 28th, 2015, which will also be the Feast of Tabernacles again. And they say that that Jesus often used, and I do preach some of this, even when I was preaching about the wedding. How many remembers that wedding? How that he left Father's house, and, or left the bride's house, went to his Father's house and see them place, and he come back and he was a type of the rapture and all of that. So they have two more to go. And these happening on these Jewish feast days, they say is more than coincidence that it's divine and preordained. Those that accept this teaching as to being prophetic expect something significant to happen or to take place in the Middle East sometime next year between or around these two blood moons that is yet to come. It may do it. It may do it. According to them, 1492 event, the Spanish Inquisition, and how that they was delivered during this time, full of blood moons, and then Israel becoming a nation, full of blood moons, taken back to Shola of Jerusalem, which is a prophetic utterance, full of blood moons, and they are expecting something to happen during this time, and we are in the middle of it. One guy who I think, I'm not sure if he's responsible for, for the beginning of these teachings, but made a major, major blunder. He made a fool out of these people. One major blunder concerning this teaching was made by a pastor by the name of Mark Blitz. That's pronounced correctly. One of the first modern day teachers to teach this theory. Now this is, he really went out on a limb with these blood men. Around 2008, Blitz began predicting that the second coming of Jesus would occur in the fall of 2015. He was alluding to this last blood moon that is to come in the year 2015 on September 28th. He's saying that the Lord would come then. But this is where he made his major blunder. With seven years of great tribulation beginning in the fall of 2008. Now, what does that date to? And what he says is absolutely false. I mean, 2013. That's eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Five years. That means we'd be five years into the great tribulation period. Right? We're not in the great tribulation period. This fellow made a complete fool of himself. Any man or woman that tries to predict a certain date of the coming of the Lord is a fool. So Jesus said himself, no man nor the hour nor the day. That means he's not going to revelate to anybody. But now listen to what he said. He said he had discovered an astronomical pattern that predicted the next Petrid would co coincide with the end time. When the prediction failed, he pulled the article from his website, but continued to teach on the significance of the Petrus. He missed it. See, he missed it. That's one of the faults I have with this teaching. I think it, I think by, by accepting it, they're getting too close into trying to predict the date. Because we know 
September 28, 2015, you know, that's the last blood moon of this hatred that's going on now. Now, John Hagee, he's a little smarter than this other fellow. Another prominent prophecy teacher is John Hagee. Hagee seized on beliefs to write four blood moons. Now, Hagee's made millions off of this. He wrote a book on four blood moons. He's probably the most renowned prophecy teacher. Which would become a bestseller, selling more than 150 in Amazon.com's top 150 by April 2014. So if you've not heard of this, it's out there. It's been taught. Hagee's broadcast reaches the world. For the weekend in March 30, 2014, it was the ninth best-selling paperback, according to Publishers Weekly. By mid-April, Hagee's book had hit number four on the New York Times bestseller list in the advice category. Hagee's book and subsequent sermon series at his home congregation, Cornerstone Church, did not proclaim that any specific end time event would occur. He was smart. He learned from bliss. He wasn't going to make a fool out of himself. He was just going to make money. As did bliss in his original prophecy. But claimed that every prior hatred of the last 500 years coincided with events in Jewish and Israeli history, allowing the Spanish Inquisition was one, Israel the nation, and Jerusalem three. However, unlike Blitz, Hagar was not foolish enough to predict the end time date. But he does hold to it if you, you listen to Hagar in his Holland's prophetic teachings. He teaches it strong, the blood moon thing, that, that it's direct from God, it's signs from God. Something happened in the last three to Israel, and he believes with all of his heart something is going to happen in the Middle East on, on a major scale during the time of the, the, that we are in now. May or may not happen. And if we're blessed to live to September 28th next year, we'll all find out, won't we? But my conclusion is just simply this. After doing this study on the blood moons, I am not ready to accept this blood moon as being signs from heaven of the final end times. I just don't. They, they have not presented enough to convince me. Um, even though the moon has been referenced several times as becoming as blood, I do believe that it will be a blood type color. One of the things that that puzzles me about them, each time that we read in Joel, in Acts, in Luke, and in Revelation, all four places, the specific time of the moon either being turned into blood or becoming as blood happened during the seven years of Great Tribulation and his son becoming a sackcloth of hair, or his son becoming dark or black, happens during that seven-year period. So I personally have a lot of problems with this teaching. And I'm certainly not ready to accept it as part of my Bible prophecy and teaching concerning the end time. As to look out and tell you that it's biblical fact that in 1492, Columbus discovered America, and he was secretly Jewish, and his, uh, he was sponsored by rich Jewish men. No, I wouldn't say that at all. As a matter of fact, our history don't even teach that. 1948 date missed a year. God could have, if he really wanted it, to be, then Israel could have become a nation on May 14, 1949, as well May 14, 1948. And I just kind of have problems with people 
living signs in proximity. You know, you know, it over a span of time. And because when you study scripture, when God gave prophetic utterances and instructions, they were generally exactly the signs. So but it is true that was the famous Cretan physician. In 1493-94, his will became state in 1948-49. They took back control of Jerusalem in 1967. That was three people doing it time. They all fell on Jewish uh, feast days. Coincidence or divine? They already got up to using the signs, whether you want to believe that or not. But I would imagine all they get to watch it. If they even been on the moon, you know, it's going to be a blood moon. I believe there's advertising there's going to be a blood moon. They did not even prove you before it came on Wednesday and, and those things that you do. But there are a lot of people. Uh, I had been asked about this a month ago. Um, a lady sent me a letter, a female minister, wanted to know my thoughts on the blood moon and these things and uh, what I thought about it, if it had anything. Now, all at the same time, I'm not absolutely ruling. I'm not. I'm not absolutely ruling it out, saying it's false teachings. I'm not saying that either. I'm just saying that I myself have studied Bible prophecy for the many years that I have. I'm just not ready to accept it at this level. Okay. All right. But it was interesting studying it out. On my part, things of that nature are interesting. When it does happen, it is a total linear eclipse. When the earth goes between the sun and the moon, and, and that, that light that passes through the earth, that atmosphere absolutely paints a red. And it looks like the moon is red. The sun dial is what it looks like. It's just painted pictures of it. And the Bible does allude to the fact so that the moon became as blood, the moon turned into blood. So uh, something, and the sun's going to be darkened. And I do believe that something will happen to cause the sun to go black. Now, I was trying to think of what they said could cause that. Um, Scientists. And they say that they they are, I don't know, maybe millions of meteorites in outer space that are seen. And, and there is uh, evidence that meteorites have struck the earth from time to time. See, in one particular place in Russia, I believe that did. And they say that can cause the sun to go black, that a meteorite could escape through, generally when things come through the earth's atmosphere, they burn up. But sometimes things escape. And if a big enough asteroid, which is thus Gilbert uses a rock, passes through and it smacks the earth, that according to the size of it, that it could just mushroom enough dust that it could block out the sun's rays for months at a time. And they say that's one way that the sun can become black. And again, with the moon becoming as blood, who knows? Maybe, maybe it will be a total lunar eclipse for that. Anyway, we know this, that we, or I believe this, that we're living in the end of time. I believe we are. And I believe that even as Peter wrote about it almost 2,000, if he wrote about it almost 2,000 years ago, 